My first experience playing Warhammer in the world that was happened fairly recently, around the tail end of 2019. One of my friends is very into 2000s era games workshop, and was keen to show me the ropes. I was of course interested in seeing these ancient systems in action. We settled on Warhammer Fantasy Battle 6th edition because it was one of my friend's preferred systems. I used my round-based orcs for Age of Sigmar, which I ran on crude movement trays. My friend was using wood elves and predictably tabled me around the 5th hour in. Despite that, I was ready for more. Our second game happened nearly a year later at the end of 2020. I had already painted up some dwarfs purpose built on square bases this time. I gibbed his forest lord with a cannon shot, which was hilarious, but my force couldn't fulfill the win condition in time. This game took about four and a half hours. I have only played two proper games of Warhammer Fantasy Battle 6 edition, and I am fully prepared to call it my favorite army scale miniatures game. Now, I have also played about a dozen games with myself on Tabletop Simulator, both for practice and also just for fun, but the fact still stands. I have barely played this game and it has won me over thoroughly. My affection for Warhammer Fantasy Battles 6th edition has a lot to do with how dense its rules are. Not necessarily complex or difficult, mind you, there's just a lot of steps involved. If I ever review 6th edition, I'll get into why a game taking potentially 5 hours to play is a good thing. But for this video, we will look at a way to circumvent both the rules load and the model requirement involved in simply wanting to try Warhammer Fantasy. Today, we are going to look at Warhammer Skirmish. Warhammer Skirmish is a 6th edition supplement that borrows the core rules of army scale Warhammer and another skirmish level system, Mordheim. Mordheim is a legendary skirmish game that works off the stat lines of Warhammer Fantasy 5th edition. That means that Warhammer Skirmish is actually readapting Mordheim back into working with 6th edition's stats and rules. Unlike Mordheim, Skirmish does not have mechanics for a campaign. It is designed for one-offs and for unique, zoomed-in set pieces to be conducted in between larger battles. It does have the rule support for this exact purpose as well as a wealth of different scenarios. The Skirmish rulebook, more of a document really, is mostly the scenarios, with a brief rule section at the start. It assumes familiarity and access to both the core 6th edition book and the army books of whatever faction you want to run. If you do not have the army books, you can also use the brilliantly constructed Ravening Hordes Compendium, which had full working rules for all the main fantasy armies at the time. If you'd like to try Skirmish for yourself, I prepped a starter pack that has the free rules for Skirmish, the 6th edition rules, and a scan of Ravening Hordes. I have also included the awesome Mordheim Living Rulebook. You can choose to play Skirmish without the minor tweaks of the main document, instead following the core Mordheim rules. I'll touch more on both of these approaches to playing as I go on. To get a real good feel for the system, I set up an 18-game gauntlet. This is built on four teams doing a three-set round robin. For this first set, I just play whatever scenario catches my fancy, changing the models up as required. I do this to learn the system and to get a feel for how it acts in weird circumstances. This style of play is arguably the closest to Skirmish's intended use. The board size here varies between 3x3 and 2x2 feet, sometimes sitting 4x4. For the second set, I play for repetitions, with the intent of getting my head around the nuances of the combat. I eliminate scenarios as a factor and run a custom showdown scenario where there are no objectives per se. The winner is decided on either a route or a total wipe. From this set onwards, all games are conducted on a 2x2 foot board. For the third set, we play the system closer to the Mordheim rules. The skirmish document uses a lot of rules from Core Fantasy, and I wanted to see how the game would play without them. As is standard for this channel's review methodology, all these games will be played double-fisted, solo. This lets me get a more holistic perspective on the proceedings, and will also let me finish the playtesting in a reasonable amount of time. I do acknowledge that playing solo can confound my judgment when it comes to certain design aspects of certain games. But for Skirmish and for Warhammer Fantasy, I feel it is an ideal way to farm play repetitions. Warhammer Fantasy takes very well to being double-fisted. For the Warbands, we use models from my collection. 
for their special rules and set lines, I use their respective books as I have them on hand either physically or digitally. Unlike core Warhammer Fantasy, these skirmish rules don't really care too much about facing. So if you are interested in skirmish, you can freely use any AOS or relevant fantasy models that you have lying around, even if they're on circle bases. It is a great use for the Warcry and Underworlds warbands, as well as those models from the Warhammer quest boxes. My own warbands are predominantly on circular bases, except for the dwarfs, who were modeled with Warhammer Fantasy in mind. The first warband is a gang of orcs, as represented by my various orcs. They are led by a black orc big boss, and I've hired a very big boy who is running the rules of an ogre. My night gobbles rep the goblin side of the greenskins and bring in a full squig herd, including a hopper. They are the only warband rocking a wizard, and they have also breached the system's guidelines, bringing in a troll. We will see how that works out. My dwarves are led by their thane and come packing the most ranged heat with two thunderers and one veteran dual wielding pistols. They are tough and slow, one of the shootiest factions in the core game. And finally, I have my ghouls repping the vampire counts, once again breaching guidelines by bringing flying units, a bat swarm and a pair of fell bats. We run their thrall as Trigoi, which means that Poleaxe is just for show. For my terrain, I'm going to use this redwood set with some fantastic trees by the awesome Terrain 4 print on Thingiverse. We keep the terrain relatively dense, with the trees and tall rocks hard blocking line of sight. I will consider both the bushes and the flat rock as elevated and difficult terrain. There is not much verticality to this setup, but in most of the scenarios, Skirmish isn't as concerned with that as more time would be. Once everything is set up, I ready my models and my tools and start clocking in those skirmishes. Warhammer Skirmish is an I go you go game, meaning that one player takes their entire turn before their opponent does the same. Skirmish follows the turn structure of Mordheim, which in turn has built its foundations on the structure of Warhammer Fantasy. I go you go by today's standards is pretty ancient design, but I think it can still be done quite well. Infinity, for example, which is a very well-made skirmish system, is proudly I go you go. It uses a reaction system to give the reactive player lots of decisions in their opponent's turn. I go you go at the skirmish level can make turns for either side go faster. There is less information for you to account for as the first player, and less uncertainty as the second player. In the context of solo play, it also makes playing double-fisted more manageable, because the mental load between the two sides is cleanly segregated. Like Warhammer, Skirmish uses d6s for all of its rolling. Most matchups will need 2-5 d6s for either side, along with a scatter dice, possibly an artillery dice for certain factions. If you don't have a scatter, you can go with the pointy side of a d8 or similar. Skirmish uses standard Warhammer open movement meaning you'll be making liberal use of a tape measure. It also follows the era convention of not allowing pre-measuring. To a modern tabletop miniatures enthusiast, this may seem like a strange rule, but it does add to both the game's immersion and the general sense of skill it feels you're putting into proceedings. Not to mention, no pre-measuring is critical to how a lot of the upcoming design elements work. A turn of skirmish has six phases, starting with the recovery phase, where stun models wake up, knock over models stand up, and panic models try to get it together. In most cases, he won't be doing much in this phase for the first couple of turns. It will however become more important as models start beating each other up. The movement phase is where your most important decisions are made. It starts with the charge step where you declare which models are charging. In Warhammer, charging is any movement that has intent to kill and is the only way a model will ever put itself into combat. Charging happens at double the value of whatever your model's movement rate characteristic is. Charges are declared and then resolved before any other movement. A charge should go through the most direct route to the target. While charging, your model may turn around corners or avoid obstacles. Enemy models may try to intercept, interrupting the movement and taking the charge in place of the intended target. This can only happen if the charge's route passes within 2 inches of the enemy model. All of this has to happen without pre-measuring, so interceptions or insufficient charges can be quite common. 
If the charging model makes it to base contact with the declared targets, the charge is successful. If the model cannot reach the target, then the charge has failed, and the model can only go half of the charge distance, staggering to a stop and rendering itself unable to act for the rest of the turn. Some models, like the Savage Orc and all of the Ghouls, have the Frenzy Rule, which means they must make a charge at the closest in-range model during the next step, Compulsory Moves. This step covers the movements brought on by psychology rules like Frenzy or the Random Movement Rules for Squigs. Once all of that is over, you finally go on to your normal movement. Models can make a move action and move up to their movement rate characteristic in any direction. This allows them to shoot later in the turn. If you want a model to go faster, running lets them go up to twice their movement rate. However, running will stop them from shooting and cannot be done if there are enemy models within 8 inches of your model at the start of the action. Unless you're a dwarf, dwarfs can just always run. Finally, hiding is an option your model can take if they make a standard move and are next to a suitable terrain piece. This makes the model hidden which means they cannot be the target of charges or shooting. Enemy models have a detection range that removes the hidden status that will depend on their initiative. So far, these are Mordheim's rules, as in they have been lifted verbatim from Mordheim and placed into the document. As such, they also cover things like climbing, falling, diving charges, things like that. I'm not going to discuss them within the scope of this video because they are things I want to cover when I review Mordheim. After movement, the turn goes to the magic phase. You likely won't be seeing a lot of spellcasters in skirmish, as the tight point allowances and random rolls can make taking a wizard real risky. Magic in skirmish uses the magic system in 6th edition. This is different from Mordheim's take on magic which happens in the shooting phase for the wizard. Mordheim's version also does not include the rules for dispelling, miscasts, or irresistible force. You can easily swap between these two rule sets as the casting rules are totally separate from the spell rules. You can also draw from multiple sources of spells within 6th edition, namely the core book and each of the faction's army books. For my games, the only caster was the Night Gobbo Shaman. He draws his power from the lore of the Little Wa and rolls 3 dice per cast. In 6th edition, spell choices are randomized, and on a good series of rolls he can end up with some deadly spells. After magic, the turn phase goes to shooting. Models that have stood still or made standard moves can try to make shots with their ranged weapons. If you're playing with Mordheim rolls, this is also where your wizards can attempt to cast spells in place of their shooting. When making a shot, you roll a d6 and cross-reference the result on a 2-hit table. Your target number will be determined by your model's ballistics skill. Most models will be hitting on 4s. Meet or beat that target number and you score a shot. Models must shoot at the closest target, unless they are in an elevated position in which case they can pick and choose. The Mordheim book contains literal illustrations of these rules, all very lovely, including some fringe cases where the further targets are easier to hit. You cannot shoot at an enemy engaged in combat with your own models unless you are running a Skaven warband. It is worth noting that the skirmish document will tell you to refer to the 6th edition core book for shooting rules, despite using Mordheim's rulings for the actual written steps. The 6th edition shooting rules has an extra negative modifier to hit, as it differentiates between hard and soft cover. Personally, I will go with more time simpler rules here, as most weapons will be firing with single dice, hitting on 3s on 4s at the minimum. They can start to feel like a waste of points once you start hitting on 5s and 6s. And that will happen very quickly if you use 6th edition's shooting modifiers. Each successful hit gets to roll to wound. Once more, rolling a d6. Once more, consulting a table. This time, the final result will be influenced by two things. Your weapon's strength and the target's toughness. It is easy to go into modern 40k streamlined rules for strength versus toughness when resolving these rolls, but 6th edition's wound chart has slightly different behavior, so it's worth locking it up whenever you roll. If the victim of the wound roll has armor, at this point it may try and make a save roll. 
different pieces of armor in different combinations grant models varying target numbers for their save roll. It is important to note that armor negation is built into strength. Anything with a strength 4 or above is going to penalize the save roll by at least 1. And anything with the armor piercing special rule removes one more from the roll. This is on top of any other special rules the model or the faction might have. Any shot that hits, wounds, and gets past the save removes one wound from the target. Once shooting is done, you move to close combats. This is resolved between models that are in base contact. Yeah. Remember that typically the only way you are getting into combat is with a charge, so models cannot simply have walked into a fighting state. Wow. Any models who charged earlier in your turn automatically go first. After the charges have finished, you then go strictly by the initiative characteristic. All models in base contact fight regardless of whose turn it is. This means the second player can make their combat decisions in the first player's combat phase and vice versa. The skirmish document once again refers to the 6e core book while using the written rules from Mordheim. So once again, I recommend simply using the close combat rules in the Mordheim living rulebook. When attacking in melee, you roll a number of dice equivalent to your model's attack characteristic. This number can be modified by special rules and the weapons the model is using. You then look up the close combat to hit table and cross-reference your model's weapon skill with the target's weapon skill. The best you can hit at is on a 3+, plus and the worst is on a 5+. Plus. Most times, you will be hitting on 4s. Any successful hits, roll to wound as in shooting. This time, using the model's strength, modified by special rules and whatever weapon the model is using. This orc boy, for example, charges in and swings twice, since he's using two weapons. He hits the ghoul on 4s, since they're both weapon skill 3. He'll wound it on 5s because he's strength 3 against the ghoul's toughness 4. Whenever you roll a 6 when rolling to wound, you score a critical hit. This counts as 2 resolve hits with no save allowed. If you are using Mordheim rules, there is an extra roll to determine the severity of the critical hit, which may allow the target saves or modify the incoming injury roll. Once you deal enough wounds to something to equal its wounds characteristic, you then make an injury roll for it. This is a d6 roll with the following results to see if you take the target out of action. If you deal wounds in excess, for example rolling a critical hit against a target with one wound, you roll all the wounds in dice and take the highest result. In this case, you would have rolled two dice, keeping the higher number. Once you get your final injury roll result, you can resolve it following the table. A roll of 1 or 2 knocks the target down. The rules recommend laying the model face up to represent this. A roll of 3 or 4 stuns the target, represented by the model being laid face down. A roll of 5 or 6 takes the target out immediately. The rules for critical hits in tandem with the rules for injury work in adapting the army scale system down to the skirmish level. Critical hits expedite damage dealing by giving you a chance to suddenly double your wounds output on any given dice. The injury roll tempers that by giving you a buffer to the final blow, effectively giving each model a built-in extra save. During their turn, during the recovery phase, any stunned models flip over and go into the knockdown state. Any knockdown models may stand back up but move with penalties and automatically fight last if in combat. All attacks against stunned or down models will auto-hit, and they are taken out the moment something successfully wounds them. On top of all that, Skirmish also employs a little bit of psychology. These are essentially Warhammer 6e's buffs and status effects, which are written in a characterful, behavioral theme. If using Mordheim's rules, which are, again, just the written rules on the skirmish document, you'll only really have to worry about persistent effects like fear, stupidity, and frenzy, along with the all-alone rule. All-alone happens when one of your models is in combat with two or more enemies and there are no friendly models within six inches of them, not counting down or stunned allies. If the model meets this criteria, they will have to make a leadership check at the end of the combat phase. A leadership check is a 2d6 roll compared to the model's leadership. Roll at or under leadership and the test is passed and nothing happens. 
roll above leadership and the test fails. The model breaks from combat and each opponent they were engaged with gets one automatic hit attack as they flee. Afterwards, if they are still standing, the model runs 2d6 inches directly away from the enemies. At the start of each of your subsequent turns, during the recovery phase, the model must make another leadership test to regain their nerves. Once they do, they may do nothing for that turn, but act normally on the turns afterwards. Otherwise, they roll another 2d6 and carry on running, possibly right off the board. If this happens, they are considered to be out of action and taken out of the game. If you are using the skirmish document, it implies the use of the panic rules as seen in the core book. This entails a few extra leadership tests, which can be a little bit fiddly to keep track of. Using these rules gives the leadership characteristic a bit more weight, as a bad set of panic rolls can immediately spell defeat for a warband. Another important use of leadership tests is the route check. This happens at the start of your turn once you lose 25% of your force, so usually once you lose 2 or 3 models. This is a pass-fail leadership check against the leadership characteristic of your leader. If you pass, nothing happens. If you fail it, you pack everything up and lose the game on the spot, full stop. Your leader is whichever one of your models has the highest leadership. Provided they are conscious and not running away in fear, they also transfer this characteristic to all friendly models within 6 inches of them. So it's important to keep track of where they are relative to the rest of your models during the game. And that is the turn structure. Effectively, the entire skirmish system. You and your opponent will take turns going through these phases. Given my custom showdown scenario's rules, most games last 20 to 40 minutes, ending at rounds 3 to 5. My initial set of 6 games was my learning set, where I played various scenarios to get the feel of the game down. The skirmish document has many scenarios and it is a great resource if you're into more narrative play. However, I also found that playing in this style by myself isn't too engaging. Without the context of a campaign system to back it up, it only really brings focus to how unbalanced and random these scenarios can be. They also tend to ask for very specific models, although they will provide suggestions for alternatives. As soon as I clocked in six of these scenarios, I was happy to move on to my more standardized custom setup. The showdown scenario is run on a two-foot square board. The deployment zones are 6 inches in from either side, creating a 12-inch gap in between the two players. This makes it easy for either player to avoid a 12-inch charge right out the gate by deploying just a little bit behind their line. I find it's enough space for some position jockeying and it also gives shooters a little bit of space to shoot. It may favor the Fast and Furious Rushdown approach, a triple ogre crew or a Skaven pack for example, but I didn't quite have the models on hand to test that out. I set the point limit for this scenario to 200 playing on a 2x2. You may be able to swing 250 without relics if you want a slightly bigger game. I have put a scenario sheet in the starter pack if you want to try running it. Set 2 was run with full skirmish rules. That entails a full Warhammer rules for shooting, for casting, and full panic rules as suggested. I wasn't too big on this configuration as shooters are already quite swingy to begin with, and giving them the extra modifier to hard cover makes them hit on 6 pluses way too often. Magic, which is already quite random, is made even more variable by miscasts and irresistible force. The presence of dispels can also really hurt a wizard-based warband. Running the panic rules as suggested is a great way to start learning 6th edition's panic system, and it's actually something I wouldn't mind mixing in with the more time style. However, this will really hurt low leadership lists. My gobble list in particular could be sent running at the first sign of trouble, especially when the shaman starts lugging it. It's thematic, sure, but sometimes you need to prioritize playability. I'd recommend house ruling this on and off as appropriate. Set 3 was done to be more in line with the Mordheim rules. This does make the entire system a lot more streamlined, although it does add the rule for variable crits. I personally prefer playing Skirmish more in line with the Mordheim rules. 
shooting is slightly more accurate, now only penalized by movement, range, and a blanket in cover modifier. Ogres are also considered large in more times rules, and therefore easier to hit with ranged weapons. I would apply this to anything vaguely ogre sized like trolls, rat ogres, yetis, etc. This can help give ranged fighters a defined niche in skirmish. Magic is more straightforward as the lack of dispels makes wizards more attractive to take. I would still maybe run with miscast and irresistible force as those rules are just amusing to have. The lack of frequent panic checks results in less running away. Breaking from combat in particular is now only limited to all alone checks. More Time also runs a tweaked version of the fear psychology rule that removes fleeing as an effect of fear on the charge. After running through the round robin, I had both a better grasp of the system and a keen understanding of how each of my warbands played. The orcs were the most well-rounded team. Orcs in fantasy have a toughness of four, so they're difficult to kill. Every orc has a good chance of murdering fellow infantry on the charge, and so long as they stay in a mob around their boss, they won't break so easily. Well-rounded does kind of mean boring though, as the most mechanically interesting thing these orcs brought to the table was the orc-flavored ogre, who could rush yeah. across the table and apply fear to specific threats. It's worth noting that orcs at the skirmish level cannot be affected by animosity unless you adapt the special orc horde rules in more time, which I did not do in this case. The night goblins definitely had the roughest go. Being led by a goblin means a very high chance to rout at first opportunity, which happened for all of their losses. However, they did come packing that trademark goblin swinginess. The troll, when it isn't busy being stupid, takes forever to kill and can pack a mean punch. Once I figured out how to let the herders die so that the squigs just run wild, they were routinely wiping out other warbands before bottling out. And of course, we had the shaman, who could be extremely dangerous given the right spell. Overall, this was a very entertaining warband to play. The dwarves managed to keep their big game feel in the transition to skirmish. Like orcs, they are tough to kill, more so because of their armor. They are slow on the approach but are surprisingly nimble within the 8 inch engagement range due to the relentless rule. Dwarf thunderers feel far too expensive for what they do, especially compared to the hammerers, who cost just about the same. If I had one handy, I would have dropped all the thunderers and just used a ball thrower, just for giggles. It would be more visually striking, at the least. Finally, we have the ghouls. All of the ghouls had the frenzy rule, which meant they would go into combat with 2 plus 1 attacks and have an immunity to psychology. This is quite strong, especially in the skirmish context because they also have poison and routinely hit those deadly sixes on the hit dice. However, they can be easy to bait because they are obligated to charge the nearest target when able. Once I figure that out, the other teams could handle them much better. Their flyers were useful for locking down key targets, but even the fear having bat swarm with its five wounds didn't last too long on the counter charge. Overall, I would suggest running Skirmish in the Mordheim style as it makes the game a lot more playable. I am going to risk calling it a more balanced experience as it lets you play low leadership warbands without spending half the game watching them slowly route in mechanical detail. However, using the Skirmish document's default rules is not without merit. I would suggest following the rules tied to the core book if you eventually want to move up to playing 6th edition. Core Warhammer Fantasy is not an easy system to learn, especially if you're coming into this totally unfamiliar with the language of tabletop miniatures games. Warhammer Skirmish is going to be one of your most solid starting points. As a standalone, one-off focused game, Skirmish is not a balanced system. It was never designed to be, as cobbled together as it is. Its modern successor in Age of Sigmar Skirmish is similarly half-baked, approaching its own parent system with the same style of scaling down. But 6th edition Skirmish does have the distinct advantage of having cribbed the core rules of another famous system, 
the sensibilities of Mordheim help to prop it up, and it is enjoyable as a tactical tabletop beat-em-up. I had a good time just repeating the showdown scenario after all, and that is just a straight-up fight. There are not a lot of skirmish systems where you can say you had fun just having a straight-up fight. The system's combat makes a lot of space for interesting decision-making even within the confines of a two-foot square. So, we have hit the end of the review, and some of you might have noticed I didn't actually look too deeply into the design of Warhammer Skirmish. There is a good reason for that. Warhammer Skirmish is really just fightier Mordheim, with a good bit of 6th edition thrown in. I want to talk about both of those systems at length when I make their respective videos. What I wanted to focus on for this video is Warhammer Skirmish's capacity as a toy box. If the frankly shocking amount of scenarios in the document didn't clue you in, it's a fairly flexible system. See, Warhammer Fantasy is not just a rich setting, it is also a highly experimental rules environment. Skirmish gives you the ability to cherry-pick bits of those rules and then sick them against each other in a controlled setting. I do hope you enjoy the video, maybe it'll push you to try out this weird little system. If you aren't already into Warhammer Fantasy, then this is a very good place to start. Thank you for watching.